thank you for folks that have uh, attended my prior presentation. This is my second time speaking at uh, Digital Dealer, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here and uh, grateful for the opportunity to do what I want to do, which is bring coaching to the car business. Um, so I'm, I'm honored you guys are here, and thank you for choosing this presentation over all the other presentations out there. Um, I, do, I would like this to be a little interactive. I don't want to just talk at you the whole time. So during the presentation, if you want to make a point or you've got some value to add for the team, um, I would love to, to hear that, okay? So today we're going to be talking about the difference between training and coaching. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. I, I spent the last 15 years on the showroom floor at a, uh, at a dealership, and uh, the last four and a half as a GSM, and what I realized was uh, when, when the owner of the company came to me after sitting in one of my sales meetings, and he said, Sean, you need to learn about coaching. And I was like, why is that? What, what's coaching? Is that when you yell at one person instead of everyone at once? I don't understand. So I didn't know the difference between training and coaching about three and a half years ago. And uh, I started reading books on it, on coaching. I, and, and the first book I read, I just, I was like, wow, this is a whole different way of being led. I had never been led like this before. I was in the army. Uh, special operations non-commissioned officer I was told what to do and then I told everyone else what to do right combat situations get stressful and we like to tell people what to do so we can save time a lot of times managers tell people what to do because they believe it saves time so after learning about coaching I quickly realized that by telling people what to do all the time you are actually turning yourself into a crutch and you are you're, you end up taking on all the responsibilities that your team should be doing and you're robbing them of their ability to solve problems. And training is critical, and both of these are employee development necessities. I want the goal from you guys walking out of here would be to know that these two things are non-negotiables. They have to happen. So that would be the ultimate objective of this presentation. Um, but ultimately, guys, we want your, I want you guys to know the difference between training and coaching. I left the showroom floor to bring coaching to the car business. And when I started doing this and visiting the dealerships, everyone's like, I already have sales training. I don't need a trainer. I'm like, okay, but this isn't training. It's coaching. And they're like, well, what's the difference? What I found was that really very few managers under, really understand the differences between the two. So um, after this presentation, I really want you to know how to train with uh, care and enthusiasm and how to coach as well and how to create a coaching culture. So we're going to cover a lot. This is a 100-minute presentation. I've condensed down to 50 minutes. There, uh, another, I want to apologize. The slides aren't that pretty. I have a lot of words in the slides. That is because it does, no you, it does you guys no good to go home, download the slideshow if there's a bunch of pretty pictures, okay? This is designed to be a roadmap for you. I want you guys to be able to get this slideshow and leverage it to create a coaching culture at your dealership, even with or without me, okay? So this slideshow is going to not be the prettiest. There's going to be a lot of words on it. But again, it's, it's designed to be more of a manual for you after this presentation, okay? Now, the reason we have to get really good at training and coaching our team and understand the difference in the two is because of the sigmoid curve. I didn't invent the sigmoid curve. Someone much smarter than me did. But what the sigmoid curve is, my friends, is it measures success over time. It is a mathematical proven formula <clears throat> that says for any action or activity that you begin doing, you will take a dip in success. Think about it. It's the, the four levels of learning, right? We're unconsciously incompetent. We don't know what we don't know. Just like when you go to tie your shoes for the first time when you're four years old. You don't know that you don't know how to tie a shoe, but the first time you try it, you mess it up, right? Then you're consciously incompetent. You realize, I, I'm not very good at that. And you're right about here. Then what happens is you get better and better, you practice, all of a sudden you can tie a shoe. This goes for selling cars as well, right? We hire a new person, and do they generally start lighting the world on fire right away? No, there's a ramp up time, right? They have to get better at what they do. As they get better and better and better, they're going to grow and start selling more cars. But at some point, they reach what? A plateau, right? And I want you to think about this. If you're a dealer, think about where is your dealership on the sigmoid curve, as I finish explaining this. Think about where are you? Are you doing things here? Is your dealership growing? Or have you plateaued off? How many guys have salespeople that sell 10 cars a month, and they've just been selling 10 cars a month for the last two years? OK? 20 cars a month. And they just sell 20, and they're, they're stuck there. OK? Guys, wherever they're stuck, if you're, I don't care if you're selling 40, 50 cars a month. If you're stuck at 40 cars a month, you're stuck at 40 cars a month. You've reached this point here. If you keep doing the same thing you've always done, you'll get what? That's not correct. I want you guys to stop saying that. Why? You're going to get less than you've always gotten. 
because as, if you keep doing the same thing, the rest of the world is progressing with or without you, okay? Also, when you reach the fourth level of learning, which is unconscious competence, that's when you're complacent. That's when you're doing the same thing and you're not paying attention anymore. It, when I was in Iraq in 2003, the, the first time an IED went off in our convoy happened to be when we were driving through the city of Mosul. And it wasn't the first three, four, five months we were there when everyone was hyper vigilant. This was 10 months into the war. We were driving down the same road we'd always driven on. No one paid attention to the pile of wood on the side of the road. If your dealership is doing the same thing you've always done, you're not gonna get the same as you've always gotten. You're gonna get less because of this. Think if the housing industry before the crash or Toys R Us, right, just happened. What if they had decided to change before the crash? Could they have saved their business? Could we have prevented the entire economy from collapsing in 2009? We have got to decide at some point that we're gonna make a change and then we've gotta do something different. Now, change when it comes to leadership, right? And that is, we've got to upgrade our leadership. We can't keep leading the same way we've been leading for the last 30, 40 years with blind obedience, just like they do in the army. We've gotta to learn to train with in inspiration, enthusiasm, We've got to get buy-in. We've got to create alignment with our team. We've also got to create coaching cultures where our leaders are going to be learning something new and taking it to the next level, just like the housing market should have done back in 2007, maybe, before the crash happened, right? So that's the sigmoid curve. Where are you at on this curve? Where are your salespeople at on this curve? If you've got a top producer who's stuck, the only way to fix them, to make them better, you can't train them anymore. There's a glass ceiling on training. We need to coach them up. Okay, you've got new people that are underperforming. They're down here. We need to coach them up or coach them out. So I'm gonna share that process with you too. So today we're gonna, again, cover that. By the way, I'm the guy on the right. That's me. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so we also have, here's the primary learning objectives. I want you guys to, again, understand training versus coaching, learn internal training best practices, and then finally, learn how and when to coach versus train. So I was partnered, uh, my first coaching client before I left the dealership, was a company called Drive Centric CRM. If you haven't seen it, it's an awesome CRM. Not here to sell Drive Centric, but being partners with them allowed me access to all these dealers' um, information, all this good stuff. So what I did was I wanted to use it for good. Um, I, I coach and train a lot of the Drive Centric dealers as well, and and um, I dive in. The dealers I'm working with said, "Hey, yeah, you can do a little research study on us." So I put together a metric that I don't know if has ever been seen in the auto industry. I'm not sure, but. I know there's a lot of turnover calculators and things like that out there, but I want to share with you what I found in going into about 30 dealerships is that new hires literally will close at about 40 percent. And by the way, I call it green pea profit loss. I can't differentiate between a green pea or someone from that was already selling cars at a different dealership. So what, I think what that means is it doesn't matter. If they're new to your store, they're new to your store and they're going to be in this category, okay? But they close at 40 percent less and they also wait on 40% more customers. So if you do the math, then someone who's been there for, if they've been there for 12, 24 months, they kind of kick back, right? How many of you guys have had a salesperson, just raise your hand for me, if, you, if you've told your, a new person in the last six months or a year, hey, slow down, buddy, let some of the veterans get some opportunities too. Has anyone been guilty of saying that? Okay, all right, thank you for being brave there. Um, so what that boils down to, this is tangible profit that we lose so if you take 10, this is a very small sample size, but I want to show you the impact it can have on your business, guys. If you take a staff with 10 tenured people and they're, they're closing at 60%, waiting on 10 opportunities each, right? That's 60 sales. If you replace five of them, just five of your tenured staff with five new hires, whether they're green peas or veterans from another store, doesn't matter. They're new to your culture and your dealership, doesn't matter. You replace half of them, now your new people are waiting on 70 of the customers, closing at a smaller percentage, now you're selling 43 cars. How many of you guys get more than 100 opportunities a month? Okay, so scaling this up to however many opportunities, just go ahead and multiply 17 lost sales for every 100 opportunities, and you can figure out how many sales you you're, could be losing. Pretty impactful, right? Now that's just the tangibles. Now let's talk about the intangibles, right? We have intangible green pea profit loss. <clears throat> intangibles such as customer retention decreasing. Guys, if you have a customer who's trained and coached properly, I promise you they're bringing in repeat and referral business. You lose those people, you lose those opportunities. Also, community reputation. Guys, if someone leaves and they're unhappy about work, having worked at your dealership, I mean, are, are they gonna be going around telling everyone how awesome it is at your dealership and how much money they can make? No, it's gonna damage your reputation in the community. 
managers, how much time do you spend onboarding or training, trying to train your new people up now? Ultimately, you're probably spending a fair amount of time, if that, hopefully, um, and that you're gonna have to do it all, all over again. Your office managers, office people have to do work. Tr uh, obviously, the rest of the team is training and helping them out. And then you talk about the internal brand of the dealership. This is something that we never focus on, guys, but all your dealerships, yes, you have a brand, you have Toyota maybe, or Honda, and then you also talk about what you do for your customers, right? You broadcast your brand to all your customer base, tell them why they should buy a car, you know, at uh, you know, Direct Auto Mall or wherever it is, all right? Guys, we're just, we always tell the world how, why they should buy a car from our dealership but because of our external brand, but what's your internal brand like? When you have constant turnover going because we don't onboard, train, and coach people properly, what happens, what do you think happens, what do the veterans sing when they say they'll hire anyone with a pulse here? If you've heard that from one of your salespeople, okay, guys, that means you have a damaged internal brand. Stressful for all employees involved. How many managers love it when your salespeople come up to you and say, are you gonna hire more people, are you gonna flood the floor? Isn't that great to hear from your salespeople? Ah, it's stressful for us as managers when we hire new people. We're always thinking, oh man, what's gonna happen with this person? You know, <laughs> hopefully they make it. And then potential legal complaints. Guys, um, I was talking to a dealership yesterday, I spent four hours yesterday morning with a, a general manager, he's not in this room, very nice fellow, but he's got two legal complaints against his dealership because of people that had left, okay, because of turnover. Coaching and training and having people development programs internally will, is a shield against those potential lawsuits. This protects you. Nothing beats a suit against uh, EO complaint than to say, well, what are you talking about? We invest in training and coaching for our people. This protects you guys, all right? So at the end of the day, there are a 10 employee engagement needs as de defined by my buddy, well, there's nine by my buddy James Robbins. He's an author, great guy. Wrote a book called uh, Nine Minutes on Monday for meeting employee engagement needs, I added one to the car business, which I believe is competition. But number one, care. Do, do my managers care about me? Number two, recognition. Am I being recognized in the way I wanna be recognized? Some people put me in a sales meeting and give me a trophy and make a big deal out of it. Other people, you try to recognize them like that, they get embarrassed, right? They get, hey, just tell me thanks on the side. I don't need to be thrown up in front of everyone. Purpose, am I doing this for more than a paycheck? I ask salespeople across the country, hey, what do you do for a living? I sell cars, why do you do it? For the money. Put that on a billboard and see how many people come buy a car from you, okay? We have to help our salespeople find a better purpose. I was coaching a dealer in, uh, a Toyota dealer in Kentucky uh, two months ago, and I met a salesman named Matt, who I was coaching him, showing his managers how to coach, right? Crawl, walk, and run uh, is how I tr train managers how to coach. I coach, they observe, then I watch them coach, and I observe them, and then I coach them on their coaching. So I was talking to a salesman and he said, I'm just not motivated, you know? I, may, I sell 10, 12 cars a month, I've been doing it for two years. My boss one thinks I can be a 20 car guy, just I'm not motivated. He's like, I go outside, it's cold, I come inside. I'm like, okay, well, let me ask you a question. What does motivate you? You know what he tells me? He goes, cancer. I go, cancer, what, what do you mean? He's like, well, my mom died of cancer, my dad had cancer, I'm proud, my grandparents died, both died of cancer. I'm motivated by, if I could do something for a cancer cause, that'd be amazing. I said, well, you're, so why aren't you motivated by money, right? So, man, I, I hear managers all the time, there's $5,000 and $10,000 in bonuses. Do you guys not care about money? No. Why? Because there's a happiness threshold on money. You, can only, you, you only need to make so much of it, and no more can make you happy, technically. And this is a, you can Google that. It's a government website that shows you, broken down by state, the happiness threshold of money. So this guy says cancer. So I said, well, are you making enough? He goes, yeah, I always make two to three grand a month. sales, that's all I need to make. Guys, not everyone needs to make 10 or 15,000 a month, okay? But guess what? Can we still get those people motivated if we find them a good purpose? He's doubled his sales in less than 60 days. After two years of being trapped on that flatline sigmoid curve, doubled his sales because now he's not selling for the money. He's donating 50% of everything he makes, over $3,000, he's donating it to cancer charity every month. He created a YouTube channel, he, or he created a Facebook group, and now that's what he's marketing. And it's all for cancer research. That's his purpose now. And as a result, he doubled his sales. And he, again, it's not about the money, guys. So mastery, am I challenged? Am I mastering new skills? Am I being trained? Uh, autonomy, um, am I micromanaged? Or am I free to make choices and come up with ideas? Growth, am I moving onward and upward my career? You have some people that want to be promoted yesterday, right? And you're like, slow down, we gotta learn some new skills first. And then you got other people that are like, I'm good where I'm at. But ultimately, everyone has a different growth need. Team cohesion, we, people wanna feel like they're part of the team, right? 
okay? They don't want to feel like they're left alone. And by the way, guys, you, do, you don't have to take pictures of this, I promise. I'll send you the entire slideshow, okay? Um, and then you've got fun. Is work enjoyable? One of, the, one of my favorite sales meetings I ever did, it was one of the last ones I did. My, te um, it, my team was down in the dumps. We were having a rough month. And I was like, you know what, let's smash a car. I know it sounds crazy, but we put on safety gear, helmets, everything. Got a sledgehammer, had a $10, $10 wholesale piece with a bad motor, and we just smashed the heck out of it. The, literally, the next week was the best week we had that year. My salespeople just thought it was the funnest, craziest thing ever. Okay, um, leadership. Do I have a leader to model after, guys? You know, this is a, any GMs in the room? Any GMs in here? Okay, if you're a GM, you're at the top of the, it's unbelievable, I coach a lot of GMs. They're frustrated because no one coaches them. It's tough being on top, it's lonely, okay? GMs need coaching too. Um, but everyone wants a leader to model after. Um, and competition, are, am I being motivated by healthy competition? So if you meet all these employee engagement needs, the reason I share this is I'm gonna show you what, which one's training is gonna meet for you and which one's coaching is gonna meet for you and that'll help you understand why you need to do both. So how many of you guys have been guilty of saying this? I have, when you hire someone, why are we hiring this guy? Well, let's just see if they stick. Why are we hiring this salesperson? Let's just hope they make it. I've been guilty of saying that, guys. That's generally what, oh, and, and I asked over 100 managers this question to see what they'd say. And I told them I was, I was using this in a slideshow and they laughed at me, they said that's fine. Name's not listed, don't worry. So to see if they make it, guys, what if we had three different objectives instead? What if our objectives in hiring someone were these, which is ensure new, new hires, new to role employees get, have a solid foundation for success, because we're gonna onboard them. What if it was to align the employee and the company to a mutually agreed upon ramp up time? Think about that, guys. Align the company, meaning the entire dealership, and the employee. Train and test for competency. How many of you guys would like that unconscious, competent pilot flying your plane? The person who's just not paying attention? No? I don't, I, I don't want them doing that. An unconscious, competent person operating on my kid. Just not paying attention because he's done it so long. On the same token, would you want a pilot who just got out of school but didn't ever get tested to see if they knew how to fly a plane, flying your plane? No, it, both are bad, right? But what do we do? We tell salespeople what to do. We tell them what to do. It's like telling someone to drive a stick shift. Hey, there's a clutch, you step on it. Then you put your shifter thing and you shift. Can you tell someone to drive a stick and then they go do, and they're able to do it? Is that even possible? But we do it all the time when we manage. One of you guys, had mentioned to me, I think it was you, that, hey, you know, I want the managers to be able to show them, right? That we can't just tell them anymore, guys. We have to show them. So when it comes to training, we need to show them. Then we need to test them for competency. And then also, we need ongoing support to ensure each employee, every single employee, continues to grow. If they stop growing, that's a problem. We've all heard the saying, green, growing, ripe, rotten, right? The, the sales, the, each individual salesperson's sales will show you if they're growing or not. Because if they're selling 30 cars a month for the last year, they've stopped growing. We've got to help them grow too. Onboarding, so not gonna spend a lot of time on onboarding, guys, but it is a, you've gotta have a solid foundation. A house built on a foundation of sand will not last, okay? There's four pillars that makes a dealership extremely successful, mediocre, or crummy. I don't have this in the slideshow, you should write this down. Number one, clarity around expectations is number one. Just like we expect our team to do stuff, and we always tell our team what they should be doing, right? Our expectations are generally fairly clear for our team, and I say fairly because it's unbelievable when I do my 360 cultural assessments how salespeople really just don't know what they're, what's expected of them. But we are constantly telling our expectations to our team, but are we learning what our team expects of us as leaders? Everyone wants to be led differently, just like everyone wants to be recognized differently. Okay, and if we don't lead our people how they want to be led, then we're not a good leader. Just to, we're, we're doing what we, and, and I'm not saying not a good leader, but to be nice and sensitive, I, I'll say that you're just leading off the shelf. You're a one size fits all leadership approach. That's great if you want a bunch of yous running around. Okay, if you want a bunch of people are exactly like you. Uh, ensure alignment to the vision and the direction of the company. Guys, we should be t saying, we should know where our company is going. We should let our entire team and our new hires know where the company is going when we're onboarding them. We say, this is where we're trying to take this dealership. And then we should align them to that. Do they want to be on that bus and are they excited to be there? It's very important. We need to show the employee the tools for success. Guys, we invest thousands, how many guys invest thousands of dollars in software or website add-ons? Okay, just one, okay. No, I'm kidding, I know you. So check this out, we invest all this money in these tools and then they don't use it. Why, because there's no training, coaching? Guys, there's three reasons they won't use it. They don't know how is one of them. They're fearful of a negative result is another one or they don't see value in it. 
We've gotta make sure we break through all three barriers to get them to use those tools. And then we need to indoctrinate them into the culture of the dealership. I'll share a quick tip on this one, it's, it's pretty fun. It's a great way to get the temperature or the pulse of your sales team. Um, I have every new hire when I'm onboarding them <clears throat> go around and ask every salesperson on the showroom floor this question and write down the answer and bring it back to me to go over with them. What is one thing you wish you knew on day one at working at our dealership? What's one thing you wish you knew from day one? And they'll come back with all sorts of wild answers um, which will help them understand. Then you can say, okay, this person's got a bad attitude. Stay away from them right now. And then you can go have a one-on-one -on -one with that salesperson and try to help get their mind right. But indoctrinate them into the culture of the dealership. Go over your vision, mission statement, or what it is you're trying to accomplish. Understand the lay of the land. Um, so I'm gonna, at the risk of you guys thinking a little less of me, I'm gonna tell you a quick story about how I got in the car business. But I got out of the Army, got back from Iraq. I took all the, the I, 13 months overseas, I saved up about 40 grand. Bought a house I couldn't afford on an arm loan. Yay, subprime mortgage crisis. I, I did, uh, did not let it get repoed for the record. <laughs> but bought a house I couldn't afford. I knocked up my fiance and then I wrecked my car going to work at Best Buy selling TVs part time. So I was doing great as a civilian. I almost went back in the army. Bobby was laughing over there. He was, a, he was an army ranger, by the way. Um, so I almost went back in the army. It was, it was rough, but uh, luckily I wrecked my car. And when I was at the dealership buying a new one, they, they hired me. A week, so a week prior, I had interviewed at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. $28,000 a year salary job. I was trying to get this salary job. I was so excited about this opportunity, they didn't hire me yet. That's because when I was walking into the interview, my wife calls me, I'm pregnant, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And I walked in there and I was like ghost white and he's trying to ask, he's asking me questions, I'm just sitting there going, and I'm like, huh? But anyway, so he calls me a week after I was working at the dealership, a week after. The enterprise guy calls me up, he goes, hey, we decided to go ahead and hire you. And I had a choice at that point, I can stay in the car business or go work at Enterprise. There was one thing that caused me to stay at that dealership, one thing. I wanna share with you what it is. The manager took me around, when I, my first day on the job, took me around, he introduced me to the office staff, he introduced me to the dealership principal, he introduced me to the service people. He said, this is Sean Kelly, guys, he's gonna be a rock star, I'm so excited he's here. We really needed this guy, I'm so glad he did that with me. That was the one thing that made me stay there. I would have left and gone to work at Enterprise, who knows where I'd be, I'd probably be at their seminar across the street talking or something, but bottom line, guys, I stayed at the dealership, became one of the top producers there within a few months because of that. Okay, so I want you to understand, leadership is a game of inches. It's all the little things you do throughout the day that add up to success. Just like failure isn't one big mess up in most cases. It's a bunch of little mistakes over time. When you have a heart attack, it's because of all the cheeseburgers that you ate over the 10 years. It's all the 10 years of not running, right? It's all the little things we do, guys. We've got to, we've got to take, look, every opportunity to lead as an opportunity to improve our guys. Guys, training is a shiny car, okay? And the reason I say that is because number one, it's expensive. When you guys step away from the desk to train someone as a leader, is it safe to say that's costing you money? Yeah. When you hire someone and bring them in from outside, whether it's, you know, Sean V. Bradley or whoever you use or Sean Kelly or Psychology, doesn't matter. When you hire someone from outside, it's expensive, right? Safe to say. Training should be exciting. When you buy a car, it's exciting, right? You have it parked in your driveway, it's pretty, it's, it, 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 it's exciting, it's enthusiastic. That's what you want your training to be. You want it to be exciting, like just like getting a new car. But it's also expensive and you have to understand that. Cars look great in the driveway. As long as you've got a good foundation and a house that's you know, on top of it, training look, it looks great, okay? So who should we be training? New hires who finished onboarding. Obviously very important. Employees that you're grooming for a promotion. How many of you guys have, no kidding, raise your hand if you do have a leadership succession plan for your, at your dealership. You know, okay, good. You know who's next in line and you're grooming them for those positions. Guys, it's unbelievable. Can, Alex, can I throw, I'm gonna throw Alex over here under the bus. Alex said earlier, he just became a manager uh, two months ago and congratulations, Alex. Give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> it's a big responsibility, my friend. You're also screwed. They're also laughing at you. No, I'm just kidding. Check this out, guys. If Alex had, I said, what kind of leadership development did you get? And he said, um, he said well, I took Joe Verde and uh, Grant Cardone training, uh, you know, uh, the sales training stuff. So what I learned from that. But uh, other than that, you know, he's done a lot on his own, which is awesome. Uh, but ultimately, guys, we've got to be grooming our people. What if they'd spent the last year training you on how to train and coach? How would things be different for you today? Does that make sense? Time management, all that stuff, right? So one man deep in per critical roles. This is unbelievable. Um, how many dealerships have one person doing a very important role like dealer trades or TOing, you know, the, the uh, floor managers, TOing customers or uh, desk managers or whatever. Just by adding, training up someone who could 
fill that backup role, you are grooming someone for a promotion. You're testing them to see if they're capable of doing it ahead of time, and you are going to be able to have your dealership run significantly more efficiently. When that manager is sick or has to go on vacation, you've got a backup now. And it's an opportunity for that other person to grow. Growth is one of the employee engagement needs, right? So we need to show people that want to move up that they can do it if they meet our expectations. They have to know what those expectations are. If we don't share our expectations, then guess what? They'll make up their own. Anyone in a new role at your store, if you are going to focus on a growth area, I was talking to my buddy over here from the RV company, and he mentioned to me that, you know, he was kind of talking about how, how do we get growth, right? If we focus on too many things at once, then we get the rocking chair effect. Do more videos, guys, do more videos. That's this week. Next week, we're call more customers, call more customers. The videos go back to where they were, right? It's the rocking chair effect. You need to pick one growth area, focus on it, train on it, make it part of your training, make it part of your coaching for a consistent 90-day period is what I, what I do with my dealers. And then also when you're upgrading your IQ or EQ, you need to train when you're upgrading your IQ or EQ. And what I mean by that is, you know, IQ meaning you're, you're, you get it, say you get drive-centric CRM and you're trying to, you need to train them on that. You need to have an in-house trainer that's gonna help the team. If you're upgrading your EQ, if you're teaching your guys how to lead or coach or communicate better, you need to upgrade your EQ. And then what should I train on? Sales processes and best practices. Everyone raise your hand right now, please. please everyone raise your hand, do me a favor, thank you. Uh, so check this out, if you are training if you are not training on sales processes, drop your hand, if you're not, okay? So mo everyone's doing that. Uh, software and tools, if you're not training on software and tools, go ahead and drop your hand, okay, good. And then what about, who, however many of you guys, drop your hand if you're not training on uh, how to train and coach. Go ahead, drop your hand, okay? So only a few left, okay? And then what about leadership training? Anyone doing leadership training? Okay, good, got a few of you guys, good. And then soft skills, EQ, even fewer dealers do this. That's how to have difficult conversations how to flex your, style, so your uh, communication styles for other people, okay? Cross-department training, almost no one does this. Where you have your sales managers, can they go work in your service drive if necessary? Could your service drive come and sell a car? Could your service rider do that? What would happen if they could? Think about that. On the job training, guys, we should do a, a, an assessment ahead of time, especially if you bring in someone from outside. We just assume they're good enough because they sold cars somewhere else, guys. Anyone ever bring someone in from elsewhere and they're like, oh, they're gonna be a rock star, and then they don't show up to work for some reason? They, that's because they, we didn't do skill assessments to find out where they were at, okay? Involve the team. I talked about aligning your team. We need our team to, get, to take buy-in and ownership of the new people. Any of you guys have veterans running off your new people? That ever happened? Okay, that's a plague. I, I hear about it. most of the dealers I work with, and that's because the sales people have no ownership with the new guys, but what if your sales people what if you assess their strengths, figured out who does what the best, and had them help you train? You can't do it all as a leader. We've got to follow the, live by the four Ds. Do, defer, delegate, delete. Okay, delegate training out to your best individuals. My, current, my last internet manager, his name's Joey, he closed at a 16% internet closing ratio. That's strong coffee, I like that number. I didn't close at 16% when I was an internet manager back in 05, so I like how Joey does it. So I had Joey training the entire team on his internet best practices. That was part of his job. Also, jo no, Joey, wanting to move up in the company, was meeting, we were meeting his growth employee engagement needs. Does that make sense? Benefits to involving the team. It's gonna make the trainer better. If you train on something, it makes you better at it. By the way, when your managers start coaching, they're gonna become significantly better at their jobs. It's unbelievable what happens there. It binds the team, like I mentioned. Help identify and cultivate the next leaders. Employees get multiple perspectives. Imagine if you sat in this presentation, same, same presenter, 10 times in a row. At some point you'd be like, man, I've heard this, this stuff before. But I bet you I could give the same slide deck to my buddy Mike here from I Recon Cars. Mike would probably come up here, could give the same presentation, you'd learn something different at that point, right? When you let your salespeople cross train, it makes a massive difference, okay? He your salespeople are now hearing it from an outside perspective, all right? You can assess the team, find out what they do well, you can assess them, because you're, right, you're assessing them now. We're, we're testing for competency. You can look at the metrics in the CRM. You can also ask them, hey, if you were gonna train your coworkers, what would you wanna train on and why? Those are ways you can figure out who would want to train, who would wanna move up. And then duplicate those proven processes. Guys, this is why we have to test for competency and this is also why we have to coach. These are the four barriers that prevent action from ha happening, okay? Can I do it? Will I do it? Do I want to? Do I need to? Let me ask you guys, which one do you think training solves? Can, that's right. Training solves can I do it. 
Will they do it? Do they want to do it? Do they need to do it? We don't know. Training doesn't solve that. Coaching does. All right? So to train like a pro, flex to personality styles. If you're training a BDC and you've got a bunch of analytical people, um, generally you would want to have more facts and data, okay? If you are talking to a bunch of zany salespeople, you want to tell more stories. IPB means interesting story, point, and benefit, okay? That's a great way to help people learn is by telling them an interesting story with a point and the benefit for them, right? Um, also, real and relevant content, guys. Don't bring in training if you're not involving your management team. It's a waste of your money. I, it, it's unbelievable. Salespeople go to the desk with this training and then they say, hey boss, here's what we're doing, just like I learned in the training, and the manager who's not involved throws it out the window when he says, we don't do it that way. And all the money you spent on the training is now gone, my friends. You've got to involve your leadership. Trainers tell me that I'm, I'm kind of nuts for doing what I'm doing. I'm taking the road less traveled because I don't go in the stores and I say, hey managers, your sales team's broken, I can fix them by training them. No, I say, we're broken as leaders and we've got to fix ourselves. You, uh, you don't want a uh, child being raised by, by a drug addict, right? The parents have to be centered for the kids to be healthy. It's the same thing at your dealership, my friends. We've got to be centered first. So I, work, I won't work with a dealership where the leadership isn't involved. I will not work with them. Real and relevant content, that's how you do that. You tie in the leadership to what they do, okay? Uh, build excitement and enthusiasm. Guys, the training has to be fun and exciting, okay? It's that simple. Um, visual aids, facilitator guides. I've got a few examples, but what it boils down to is you want to create things that your team can take back to their, um, you know, take back with them. You know, this is like a workbook here. This is a job aid on a sales process. This is a, this is a custom built needs assessment for a dealership that we built with the team. Um, ultimately, you want job aids that they can leverage, right? Because otherwise, are they using it? Are they using the tools you've given them? We don't know. Employee engagement needs. So training meets these employee engagement needs, okay? So we've got care, recognition, purpose, mastery. The, the, those green ones are the ones that training is gonna meet. Now, what does coaching do? Training is the shiny car. Coaching is the fuel that makes it go, all right? We can't take our shiny car from A to B without gas in it, right? So how do we do it? Who should we be coaching? Employees that have already been tested for competency. They've been onboarded effectively. They've been trained effectively. They've been tested for competency and they passed the test. Now we can start one-on-one -on -one coaching with them. We don't need to invest, the manager's time is too valuable to coach someone who is not trained up properly or has proven to be competent. It, it, they have to prove to be trainable. Then they can prove to be coachable, okay? Middle and top performing veterans is 20% increase. Do you, wanna, do you wanna increase a 10 car salesperson by 20% or a 40 car salesperson by 20%? Where do you get a bigger ROI, right? We, want, we need to work with a, coaching is how you improve your top performers. Bottom performers, we need to coach them up or coach them out, okay? They are costing you money. That's one of the hardest things about our job is to try to get rid of an employee that's underperforming, at least for me. Some of you guys might say, no, it's easy, I just fire them. <laughs> It's a challenge for me, why? Because I value the people, and I I'm sure you guys do too, or you wouldn't be here, it's that simple, I know that. But we've got to coach them up. We've gotta have a process for that, I'll share that with you. Also, all leadership, every manager, the owner, the GM, every leader needs a coach, okay? Every, almost every executive at Fortune 100 companies all have coaches. They all have coaches for a reason, guys. Why are we not adopting the same practice? The owner of the dealership should definitely be getting coaching. This is a four-step process to create a coaching culture. Drip method, okay? First off, discover what each employee wants most. I can't coach you unless I know where you're trying to go. What is your destination? As a coach, my job is to help you get there. What does each employee want most? Coaching a, a salesperson named Lauren uh, about two, two months ago at this point, three months ago in Connecticut, actually. I'm gonna see her again next two weeks from now. Anyway, so we're, in the, we're talking to her about, hey, Lauren, what are you trying to accomplish? She's like, I want a nice house with Chanel purses. I want nice stuff. I've been poor my whole life, but you know, all that. I'm like, awesome, well, let's help you get there. What do you need to do more of? She's like, uh, we had a great coaching conversation about how to hold money on trade-ins, because you can't make money on new cars there. Okay, no problem. Where can we make money? After the, at the end of our coaching conversation, she decides she's going to do silent walk-arounds. She's gonna do all this. She leaves. Over the next two weeks, she holds $9,000 on trade-in gross, okay? Putting three grand in her pocket. Uh, her manager's like, he, he calls me up the GM. Sean, I've been telling my entire team this, training them, Tell, you know, floodlight thinking. I've been telling my entire team this, training them on doing silent walk for the last two years. You have one conversation with her and she's doing it every customer now. Because I connected the dots on what she wants most with what she needs to do. And I didn't tell her to do it. She came up with it herself. She knew how to do it right. Just like your salespeople that have been training probably know how to do it right. But they don't know why they should be doing it. So by finding out what they want most, we can tie it. 
Recruit them to the cause. You can't just sit down with people and start coaching them. Steve, what do you want most in your career? Steve's like, whoa, what, I don't, you have to earn the right, okay guys? You have to tell the team why you're doing it. Start with why Simon Sinek, okay? We all know, we've heard of that, I'm sure, by now. We, so, I, I have a letter, you can, I'll tell you what, it's not in the slideshow, you wouldn't be able to read it if it was up here, but in my, I have a mobile app with files, you can download, I've got tons of scripts and stuff. I have a recruitment letter, basically it's letting the team know, we are going to be creating a coaching culture and here's why. And it's a real good explanation on that. Um, you guys, if you want my app, it, it's totally free, I won't, it doesn't put you on a mailing list or anything like that, um, then you can download that letter or I, I'm happy to uh, email it to you if you want. Individually set expectations around coaching. Everyone wants to be coached differently, okay? We need to ask them, have you been coached before? What was it like? If you could be coached, how often would you want to be coached, right? What should I do more or less of when I'm coaching you to make it more valuable for you? Persist in making it a priority. My coach was in Ireland <clears throat> speaking and it was crazy because he mentioned to me, he, says, uh, he, he said that the manager stood up, he goes, how am I gonna do all this coaching with all the responsibilities I need to do? And, uh, and then another person in the audience stands up and he said, no, no, the question is, how are you gonna do all those responsibilities with all the coaching you need to do? Okay, this needs to be priority. I asked, there was a book I read called The, 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 um, the One Thing. And, and The One Thing asks this question of managers. It says, what's one thing you should be focusing on that will make everything else easier or unnecessary? And this is for you, my friend, who wants your life to be a little bit easier as a manager. And there's a gentleman in the back who, uh, who told me this too last night. We were talking at the, restaurant, at the uh, bar. One thing you could be doing that'll make everything else easier and necessary for you, it's developing your people. If your people get better, you don't have to do all the problem solving, guys. There's three types of coaching. Aspirational coaching, that's we help them get where they wanna go. There's turnaround coaching, where we coach them up or coach them out, and then there's objective-based coaching, when you're identifying the gaps and the opportunities, it's your agenda, and you're sitting down with someone. So there's three types of coaching you can leverage to help your team improve here, all right? This is my framework for coaching people that has made a massive impact. I wrote this working with Drive Centric and it had a huge impact. Um, but again, we're discovering what they want most. We're recruiting them. Guys, don't give them the answers. Ask questions, figure out what puzzle pieces are missing in their box. Then give them the missing puzzle pieces. That's coaching. Training is giving them the puzzle. Coaching is when you find out what they don't have and you add value. 100% value add every time when you do it this way. I don't tell them what to do at the end of coaching. I ask them what they're willing to do, what they're going to do. How can I help hold you accountable around that? If you fail to meet this commitment, what should I, how, how should I hold you accountable, right? How can I support you as your manager to make sure you accomplish this? How should I approach you in a supportive way? These are all questions you can have asked to make sure, to make sure that the game plan, they follow through with the game plan. You schedule on your calendar. I'm gonna follow up two weeks from now. When I text, how did I find out about the $9,000 that Lauren held? on trade -ins. I text her and I said, hey Lauren, on my calendar, I'm supposed to follow up with you. Are you doing your silent walk around? She texts me back. Care for the plan long term. And then also, what was your biggest takeaway? We need to ask them that. Double loop learning. ABCs, objective-based coaching. Dive into your CRM, guys. Assess the metrics. Tell the team, hey, come over here. I want to help you be more successful. I want to help you get that house in Chanel Purse, Lauren. I found a metric that we can improve that'll help you get that. Are you open to talking about that now? Is now a good time? But what do we do as managers? Lauren in my office, the whole way there, she's not thinking, I'm gonna get promoted, yay. She's thinking, I'm gonna get in trouble. You know what I mean? Because we default to fear. That's why we've gotta recruit them to the cause. We've got to get the buy-in, right? Step two. Next, guided autonomy. How many of you guys feel like you're the problem manager instead of a sales manager? You deal with problems all the time, you're like, man, the salespeople come to me and they're like, uh, I need an extra key. I don't have floor mats. And you're like, really, you need me for this? I'm, you know, so check this out, guys. When your salespeople ask you a question that you're like, they should know this. They should know this. Why don't they know this? When they ask you that, that's because you're giving them the answer every time. You're turning yourself into a crux. Just ask them this every time. Hey, you're a lot closer to this situation or problem than I am, and I trust your judgment. So in your opinion, what's the best way to handle this, this problem? They'll tell you. They'll tell you an answer. They'll start thinking for themselves. The first time they're gonna be like, oh God, smoke's gonna pull out of their ears, all that. But then you just say, they might give you a bad, if they give you a bad answer, all you do is say, let's walk that through its completion. What happened, right? We can always say, let's try something else instead. Turnaround coaching, guys. Commit to the process. Underperforming person. You should either coach them up or coach them out. Four weeks is all it takes. You don't have to let them sit there and hope they get better over the next six weeks, okay, or six months, or six years. Meet with them every week. Marcio, how committed are you to working for my dealership on a scale of one to five? five. You're a five? Well, I'm a 10 to keeping you. 
So here's what I want to do. I want to help you succeed here. I want to help you stay here. I'd like to meet with you one hour a week for the next four weeks. At the end of a month, we're going to shake hands as friends if it's not a good fit, or we're going to celebrate that you made it. Does that sound like a plan? I'd like to share my expectations with you. I meet with them once a week for the next four weeks, and he, we're coaching them up or coaching them out. If they're not coachable, they shouldn't be working for us. Safe to say? Guys, your training, the shiny car in the driveway, the coaching, we need to be telling the world that we do this at our dealership. Do you want to attract salespeople that are trainable and coachable and want training and coaching? Would that not be a good uh, team to have around you? Let them know what you do. These are the employee engagement needs met by coaching. Care, recognition, purpose, mastery, autonomy, growth, leadership, and competition. If you're doing training, ongoing, you have a program, and coaching, all the employee engagement needs are consistently met across the board. Your employees will run through brick walls for you. This lowered my turnover from 93% at my dealership to 18% over the course of 24 months. Here are a bunch of coaching wins. How can you measure that coaching's winning, right? You keep track of it. You need to log every coaching conversation, notes, bullet points, action items. Just type it up as you go along. Afterwards, you, when you're revisiting these things, these are just some coaching wins. Uh, one dealership improved 12% to 90% to on TOs. Um, we had a, you know, this is my turnover at my store. Three month salesperson average increasing five and a half cars for 20, that's uh, 20 uh, salesperson team. Um, all sorts of wins you can have from coaching. Uh, in, internal surveys of managers. You got the, uh, any pitchfork managers as my coach calls them, or they browbeat and all that. Guys, that is uh, internal survey. 2.1, they went to 4.9 after six months of the managers coaching their team. That's how much the, the people liked working for their managers when they started coaching them. So just to recap, my friends, because um, we are right up on time here, um, basically, train, do you got, let me ask you guys, do you see that training is foundational, subjective, right? We've got an agenda, job skill focus. It'll, you can align the group. It's inspirational and it's a floodlight, whereas coaching is potential-based, right? We can help everyone meet their uh, potential, objective. It meets employee engagement needs, taps into each person's individuality and their strengths, uh, it's more supportive and it's more focused, like a flashlight. You, see, you guys see the difference? How many of you guys see a much bigger difference between training and coaching now than you did before here? Awesome. Thank you. Very good. Quit trying to find good people. You've already got them. They're on your showroom floor. Okay? We need to treat our employees like they're our kid and build them up. Okay? We can never stop constructing and building our team. The moment that you stop training and begin coaching, you are going to take your team to the next level. Okay, guys? Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I will be out in the hall for any questions, okay? Really appreciate you guys.